60 minutes. And what we're going to cover is incidents and accidents uh, in gliders from fiscal year 2020 of the FAA. And we're going to cover motor gliders and tow planes uh, this evening. We did pure gliders in the older reports back in part one. We're doing part two this evening. And it is the New England FAST team that works to put this together. A lot of great people behind the scenes. And, you know, we've dealt with a couple glitches here tonight. Is uh, Dan Carter, who's the operations FPM from Bradley, is stuck on the road. He, he called us in a little bit of a panic. Uh, so he's not going to be able to join us, but he, he normally does. And he is a glider pilot, tow pilot himself and everything. And Rob Leonard on the maintenance side is here with us. He's going to be helping out a lot tonight, uh, more than he originally planned. You want to say hello, Rob? Hi, everybody. Great to be on board tonight. Thanks. Looking forward to learning a lot. Thanks. Excellent, excellent. And then I'm from the Boston FISDO, uh, part of the New England FAST team also, and that is me. And then also joining us is one of our terrific WINGS pros, uh, David Strasberg, who, same thing, he, he, he is here tonight. He was able to pull off on the side of the road and has found a quiet little place. So you want to say hello, Dave? Yeah, sure thing. I'm uh, sitting on the side of uh, 91 and a place with good Wi-Fi here, looking at all the lovely thermals up in the sky, wishing I had a chance to fly today. I uh, want to thank everybody for joining us, and I look forward to all the information uh, Steve has to share with us tonight. Terrific, terrific. So we're going to work on helping you out a couple housekeeping items ahead of time, is we will get the Wings credit uploaded. It will take a few days. Uh, I know my schedule is pretty booked tomorrow, so it probably will be likely on Wednesday that I'll get the there. You can catch a recording of this and other webinars that we do in the New England Fast Team on the Boston Fast Team YouTube channel. May take about a week. We just put the one up that Rob did, what, last Tuesday night? Uh, that's coming out tomorrow. So please like, subscribe to it, find out what's going on. On there and also on FAAsafety.gov for glider oriented things, although not exactly. 100% uh, glider oriented, but there's a couple FAA safety courses that we've put together that are associated with gliders. You can find those are ALC 629 and ALC 612. It's gliding for the airplane pilot and, oh no, I'm landing out. Also, I mentioned there are handouts. There's five of them tonight. Feel free to take a look at those. May take a little while to download some of them with it. And this is the Boston Fast Team YouTube channel. Like I said, is please subscribe and like. You will find part one of this presentation published on there already. I updated this picture so you can see it. And also there is the 2019 copy. You may also find some other interesting things for the glider pilot types, such as a little video we did on the glider accident that never happened. So I always do ask, and Dave knows this, and we work with it, is, you know, we always look to promote, educate, and improve. And one of the big things with that is being a proficient pilot. And doing that is kind of being part of an organization, which is great in the gliding community, uh, the soaring community. Almost everybody is part of an organization. And that'll actually come up tonight with the uh, motor glider crowd. And then also annual checking is, we find that if you really work to make yourself proficient and do annual checking every year, and even if you're a professional pilot, maybe stepping down into the glider, it's a good idea to not only use, you know, your check from your airline to meet the regulatory requirements, but to add that proficiency that you really do need if you're flying in the glider or maybe flying something tailwheel also. And the way that we do it here in the FAA is we have the WINGS program. If you don't have a regular program available to you, or even your club may want to use the WINGS program. And there are WINGS pros out there to help you uh, find out about that program. And I'm going to actually turn it over to you, Dave, for a moment, because you're a WINGS pro and you're more up to date on how to find the WINGS pros and are a big, big advocate for soaring clubs to use the WINGS program. Yeah, sure thing, uh, Stephen. I was actually working with uh, somebody that I'm trying to recruit to be a WINGS pro 
a friend of mine in Florida the last couple of days. And um, if you look at that uh, the homepage for the WINGS program there on the left side, that second little blue box that says hot topics, it, uh, it rotates through with a variety of different uh, options there in that space. And one of the new ones that they put in is actually a spreadsheet. It'll say, uh, click here to find the WINGS pros. And it's a nice uh, national spreadsheet with the phone numbers and the email addresses for all the WINGS pros uh, across the country. And I know it's been a little bit difficult in the past to go search in the directory. You had to do a keyword search or something like that. So if you just go to FAAsafety.gov and you just sit there for a second, you'll see that scroll through and you can find a, a Wings Pro, you know, that can help you with any questions you have. Uh, don't spend a lot of time. We want you to spend your time flying and being proficient, not spending time trying to figure out how to work the website. If you have difficulties at all, please reach out to a Wings Pro. Um, that's why we're here. Excellent. And we do want to thank you tonight for joining us for part one. And there's two parts to the wing program. It's the knowledge portion and the flight portion. The knowledge portion, part one, includes three levels of knowledge that cover these topics. And then part two is the flight portion. You know, and we all do need that. This is a picture of me from years ago doing some of the uh, flight portion in the wings program with an instructor. And for gliders, flight number one covers takeoffs, launches, and tows. Flight number two covers slow flight, stalls, steep turns, ridge lift. And flight number three covers soaring, wave and thermal, and downwind off airport landings right out of the practical test standards. Yeah. And there are some handouts, both that Dave has created and I have created in the program tonight that you can download and help you use at your club. And the last little benefit is you almost can get paid <laughs> to be a proficient pilot. We're continuing on with the uh, wing sweepstakes, which is $10,000 in prizes that are divvied up around the country. Uh, when you complete a level of wings, you get an entry. Also, Dave, correct me if I'm wrong, as an instructor, each student that you do a level of wings with you also get one entry as an instructor is that correct yes yes that's correct and you really don't even have to be the one that does all the work you just have to be the one that does that last credit out of the six so that they complete see the phase so um i did have a, a good close personal friend of mine that um we turned into a glider instructor uh two years ago and got him involved with wings and he actually won uh, one of the prizes locally here, uh, grand prize, fifteen hundred dollars. So I'm telling I'm still waiting for my cut of that, but I haven't I haven't seen any money yet. <laughs> well, and this is a picture here in the Boston area. An assistant chief instructor at one of our flight schools, Vicky Quo, won a lesser prize. Uh, completely surprised her. She's been an advocate for proficient pilots and wings for years. She wasn't even thinking about the wing sweepstakes and got contacted back in February and told congratulations. And you know the amount of money that she made would cover exactly what it would cost to go do the WINGS program just about in an airplane. So a terrific program out there and available. Now, the disclaimer for this evening, uh, you know, which is part of it, is really what we're trying to do. And we send this out to instructors and commercially rated pilots primarily across the country and gliders, um, is to provide materials for discussion between the instructors, the pilots. We try to avoid speculating, but we do try to provide additional information that we can. Um, most of this comes from the NTSB, but as a fast team program manager, I have a bit more information available to me. And that information that's okay to share with the public, I've tried to do so in here. So you'll see some asterisks and things like that with it, uh, with it to highlight what may be above and beyond what you get from the NTSB right now. Um, it is as accurate as I possibly can make it. You may have seen. Last time I updated this was just four or five days ago on the 21st. Things may have changed since then. Uh, you know, it's very dynamic. <clears throat> There's also the possibility for some intense pictures uh, in here. Just do be aware of that. We're not trying to frighten people, but what we are trying to do is provide a very straightforward, honest uh, description of what's going on out there. And with that, you know, when we're out there flying, 
trying to help us all learn. I will mention what I call takeaways, and that's for the instructors to think about. These are just what hit me or made me think as an instructor when I looked at each of these accidents. They may or may not be directly related to what happened on the event. Also understand, we all are capable of having an accident. We wanna be careful of that. You know, and Dave and I, there's a picture of us flying together in a glider in some cold weather, but you know, we end up having that discussion that we all make mistakes, even us as instructors. And we got to take what we can and find those insights for teaching to try to help our students out there and use it for the recurrent training that we do. And last but not least, just remind us what is important. So just so you know what we do have out there in the audience tonight and to help us understand a little bit more about you, we have a couple poll questions and I'm going to turn the, this over to Rob now, if he could go ahead and go through the poll questions. We do have we do have about 170 plus, it's continuing to count up, of you out there right now. So we have a poll, poll. 50 registered. And if you want to go ahead, you got the first poll question launched, it looks like, it's, Rob. It's ready to go. So I have the following glider credentials, uh, CFIG private or greater, glider rating, silver badge or greater, tow pilot, student or other type of pilot not yet rated in gliders. As of right now, we've got about 73% of you voted. We're gonna wait a little bit longer. Getting up to 78%, 80, 81, 81. Let it go a couple more seconds. Five, four, three, two, one. I'm going to close it. And I'm going to share the results. See if I glider is 46%, private or greater glider rating, 58%, silver badge or greater, 25%, tow pilot, 30%, and student or other type of pilot not yet rated in gliders, 19%. Thank you for all participating. Steve, you want me to go ahead and launch that second poll now? Yeah, go ahead and get started. I'm gonna make two quick comments. I'm very happy to see that near 50% of the people online are flight instructor glider, which is terrific. I'm also happy to see that 30% or more, at least a third of you out there are tow pilots because a lot of tonight will hopefully help help you out also. Okay, and I'm gonna go ahead and launch the second poll. There we go. So the next, second question, second poll is, the glider launch method I use most often is arrow tow, self launch, ground launch, winch, ground launch, auto or other. Please make your entries. Wow, 74% already have, have entered. Excellent, we're moving right along. <clears throat> Just over eighty percent, eighty-two percent, eighty-three. We'll wait for a couple more seconds. Five, four, three, two, one. I'm gonna close it. I'm gonna share the results. Steve, would you like me to go over them or do you want to talk about them? Um, I will talk about them. It's terrific. Thank you for okay. up there. Well, it is what kind of expected, but I did ask this question or I did include this because I just wanted to verify. We are talking a little bit of tonight about motor gliders, um, self-launch, which is becoming more and more popular. We don't have a whole lot of ground launch operations here in the U.S. We use um, aero tow a lot and that's part of the reason why within this program I pay attention to the tow planes also so that is absolutely terrific Rob if you could do me one little favor and just hide that now excellent and we are back to the screen so a few little insights I did mention the Soaring Safety Foundation I do want to put a word out for them 
terrific, terrific background on accidents. And I look at what we're doing here tonight as just a supplement is I have some capabilities to maybe see some stuff that they don't see. And correspondingly, they might know stuff that I don't do. Uh, but it just so happens as I get around to doing this uh, every year, it tends to be around the same time. It just came out in the April issue as the executive summary of their annual report on aviation or soaring accidents and incidents. Uh, it is posted to the website soon, and, and I included a PDF copy here. And I do want to ask, it will come up maybe again, but I do want to ask the Soaring Society of America and the Soaring Safety Foundation ask clubs to participate in uh, their launch and flight time database. And it really, really would help them out. Uh, probably more than even I, it would, could help us out in the FAA, but could really help the Soaring Safety Foundation get a better understanding of how much soaring activity is out there. As I mentioned, most of this comes from the NTSB. A lot of great information too on the reports with what's known as the docu docket management system, uh, where you can find pictures, videos, um, pilot interview stuff associated with the accidents that is much more readily available now. There is a new search engine on NTSB if you're looking for accidents from 2008 or later. Uh, so that might, if you haven't been to the site lately, it might take you a little bit to learn that new search engine, but it, it does work out fairly well. And then I pull a lot of stuff from a lot of different FAA data systems also, you know, whether it be surfers, incidents, pilot deviations, ICAO safety reports, all sorts of different things. And I'm going to cover a little bit of what I call the state of the sport activity wise. This is information that we in the FAA tend to gather um, from different sources. This almost always comes from the annual GA activity survey that you can find on FAA.gov. And here's the past few years of what they report as their best estimate in terms of the total number of hours flown in the glider fleet. You can see a little bit of up and down with that. This is the trend of what they consider to be the active number of gliders in the fleet. Now that is active number. That is not necessarily the total registered. Um, there's a little bit over 2000 in the registry database um, back in 2019, but they think it was just a little bit over 1,500 of them were active. And in their GA survey, oh, I do want to mention back here on this one, this dip here in 2013, I'm putting the spotlight on the wrong screen, but this dip back here in 2013 is probably due to the re-registration. We do know that people kind of got caught up in that. We had a maybe some aircraft out there that were not re-registered in time. So we do think that we see that dip of a few hundred active aircraft is just because of the re-registration rule that went into effect in 2013. By the GA survey, this is the um, average hours per aircraft in the glider fleet each year, generally about 50 hours. Uh, there is a portion of the EASA survey uh, that is available in the handouts, and they estimated their glider fleet activity at about 66 hours per airframe in 2019. I also failed to include this in part one, although I had done it way back when, but it also just out of curiosity, I keep track of the number of knowledge tests that we have every year associated with a glider. And you can see down here at the bottom, the sport pilot uh, glider and also the sport pilot instructor glider is very few of those are issued every year. Uh, sometimes as many as four, onesie, twosie, sometimes zero. The most popular test, of course, is the private pilot glider test, which we're seeing some uptick back here, which is terrific. And then our Commercial glider is the gray, tends to be around the 50 to 60 tests per year. 
the flight instructor glider, which is the straight test for someone that does not have an instructor rating in another category, is just a little bit less than that, usually about 40 per year. And then just a little bit above that, 60 to 70 per year, are people that are, say, already instructors in airplanes and are working on adding the glider instructor rating. So I thought this could be an interesting statistic that is available out there that comes directly from the um, AFS, what is it, 610, 620, that does the knowledge testing. And also within the GA survey, this came up last time in part one in a lot of debate on this and had a lot of conversations with people out there about this and I'm glad it really caught people's attention but you know it was not a giant surprise to me is if you look at the average number of landings per hour and this is out of the uh, FAA general aviation survey is single engine piston aircraft that are one two or three seats are averaging a little bit over two landings per hour that kind of makes sense a lot of training aircraft out there a lot of them doing touch and goes four seat piston um are or four or more seat that can be six seat nine seat whatever are about one and a half the single engine piston total is about 1.6 and all pistons if you include twins and everything else are about 1.5 but the glider fleet is only down around 1.4 you know, generally, gliders as a whole, not every glider, but gen generally gliders as a whole are doing fewer landings per hour. And, you know, a lot of people had questions about this. So I actually went back. I had some data from the club I fly with and even used myself because I have the data directly for my own aircraft. Is you can see, this is the average flight time for each flight, i.e., each landing uh, in our club gliders, and most of them are pretty darn close to half an hour. And even the classic training one, the 233, which uh, you know Microsoft Excel I see did a terrific job of changing the two <laughs> to the month of February, but the 233, we average still about 0.3 hours uh, for every flight. And you know, you take that down, that's only three landings, maybe four landings per hour flown in that aircraft. And that is including, you know, all the training where you're doing repetitive practice and landings uh, with people, uh, you know, just pattern toes, some premature termination of toe type events. But then you get a student that stays out there for, you know, half an hour, hour, maybe even a little bit more on a solo flight. It's a good soaring day. You want them to take advantage of it. And, you know, you're not kind of rushing them to get back. It does end up being, you know, not that many landings per hour. And that was something a lot of people had questions about. And I hope these two slides here can help people understand that really in gliders, we're not putting as many landings on them compared to other types of aircraft as we may have thought we were. The fiscal year, just so you know that we are covering the data, covers the FAA fiscal year that goes from October 1, 2019 until September 30th, 2020. And with that, I want to just talk about the state of the sport and what I call the other events to give you an idea of what we're looking at other things within the FAA safety wise that'll help you um, understand what's going on. This is not the stuff you're going to find on the NTSB at all. This is stuff that is internal that someone like myself, a fast team program manager, and we'll share it with safety reps and wings pros like Dave, so he can go talk to clubs about it. But what are the different things going on? And one of the things we use is an internal system that's called the Emergency Operations Network. You know, you, you think of the war room of ATC and what's happening in the aerospace industry at any given moment is being looked at by headquarters in Washington, D.C. And this is the type of reports that end up showing up there where things may be accidents, incidents, what's going on. 
Of course, there's very few of them <laughs> that occur with gliders. As I checked for 2020, we had 52 that had the word glider in them. But, you know, I thin that down to 35 reports because sometimes it's a hang glider or a paraglider or something like that. What is interesting to note if we look at these, and these are just like the initial notification, like, hey, something happened with a glider in Massachusetts. Um, you know, that's what we're kind of looking at. But two of these 35 events were with tow planes. Seven of them were with motor gliders. Uh, and here were the type of reports that we ended up looking at. You know, a few fatal accidents, which is horrible. Uh, most of them are accidents and incidents. This is where we usually get first notification on it. We have an occurrence is an FAA term. Uh, we had four of those. Believe it or not, we had a laser event uh, with a glider this past year. Someone pointing a laser at a glider. Near midair collisions, pilot deviations, all of that. And this is something that I'm checking uh, nationwide on a weekly basis just to kind of see what's going on with gliders. You know, an outlanding may end up happening or showing up on this, even if no damage or anything. But if the police end up showing up for it, you know, because someone called in an aircraft accident, even though it really wasn't, that's the type of thing that may show up on this type of report. So some of the interesting things, as I mentioned, the laser, blue laser illuminated the flight deck. Thankfully, no injuries. That's not much fun. You know, the glider didn't assess the amount of smoke in the air. The pilot had no radio. The tower visibility was two miles with smoke due to forest fires. You know, pilot deviation reported by such and such airport when an unknown glider and tow aircraft entered the class Delta airspace without contacting ATC. We also have another reporting system that I dig into a little bit deeper. Again, just we don't have many of them with gliders like you would see on turbine aircraft or turboprops because, you know, it's taking place outside of the typical public eye. Uh, and hopefully and thankfully, there's not many events to really worry about. But if we look at the count of what or FAA incidences or occurrences in the activity. This is what we ended up seeing uh, throughout the year. This just gives you an idea of the things we're taking a look at here within the FAA. You know, and I do a search here where I use the keyword glider and, you know, see if it's a paraglider, hang glider, dig through all the details of it. One thing that is interesting to note on this is any of the complaints I did end up removing. So I'm showing zero, but it was hard to tell uh, in those reports. There just wasn't enough information. So there could have been a couple people that did complain about gliders flying illegally, in theory, in their eyes. It uh, doesn't mean that they were, just means that somebody thought they were. And then also the near midair collisions. We did have eight reports. What's interesting to me is seven out of those eight reports were assigned to be investigated by maintenance or avionics inspectors. Now, I'm just curious here, Rob, how many times have you had a near mid-air collision report assigned to you? Uh, not one. <laughs> yeah, it, it, and that's why I found it interesting. I don't know if you know it's due to staffing issues or whatever, but that was a very interesting statistic to me because it's very atypical to have that occur. There usually are comments with these. I pull out a few of these comments just so you can get an idea. You know, you might find some of this interesting. That's all that I did was try to pull out what I found. But glider pilot self-reported a near mid-air collision near such and such airport. No site visit by the FAA or NTSB to, due to COVID-19. Uh, this was an interesting one. Advise the airport operations manager a safety concern of a potential obstruction to taxi visibility created by the presence of a large glider trailer parked between the parallel taxiway and a converging taxiway. And believe it or not, this was one <laughs> where it 
they believe it was an issue is two turboprop aircraft collided on the taxiway and it was reported that at least one of the aircraft didn't see the other one because its view was blocked by the glider trailer that was put in between two taxiways. Some of the other comments, being towed behind during a flight review and enter the class Delta airspace without prior um, radio communication with the tower is this happens, but a motor glider initially stopped to hold short of the runway, but then proceed across the hold short line without a TC authorization is yes, gliders, especially motoring motor gliders, and especially like touring motor gliders, could end up having a pilot deviation and a runway incursion, which we had. Other one is an interview with a pilot revealed while attempting to release the rope and tow. The pilot was distracted, but eventually properly configured for a stable approach, although it was slower, which led to the nose wheel hitting hard. And I think that was for a tow plane. Also, another terrific system that's out there, we commonly call it the NASA system, but I look at that, the Aviation Safety Reporting System. There were 16 reports there. I do the same thing. I ferret out hang gliders and paragliders and all of that. It is available that you can use and submit electronically now. And if you want more information about it, you can take a look at Advisory Circular 00-46 ECHO. It is a great system. It is mostly common. And I'm going to give another little plug to the Soaring Safety Foundation here that does have a similar system that is glider specific. And the whole purpose, or a major purpose, let me say that, for them doing that is they're trying to collect data to use for scenario-based training for the instructors out there. And that's one of the big benefits that you can have. If you are interested, that is the website right there. And I would encourage you to use that. It is a terrific program. And in the NASA forms, aviation safety reports, here's what we had listed is near mid-air collisions were the largest amount, ATC issues showed up, aircraft equipment, critical equipment showed up a little bit, airspace violation, ground conflicts. And again, a few comments that may you might find interesting, or at least I did, is the tow plane was turning to the right and, I, and was on a collision course with me. I pulled the nose to gain altitude and the tow plane passed under me and departed the area is this was where the tow plane and the glider pilot upon uh, release from tow both turned to the right this one was from atc recommending class b or at the very least a class c extension to protect the arrivals into their airport from glider activity um you know this glider pilot probably had a challenging conversation with his flying buddies as Sailplane pilot reported he was contacted by the center and advised that some of the sailplanes flying with him were violating class alpha airspace. He would, uh, this pilot did not report that he was or that ATC had told him that, but they were talking to him, so they asked him to call the other aircraft that were. Um, this was another interesting one is another aircraft having a conflict emergency trying to get into an airport and then a glider was being towed down the runway and they don't believe anybody was monitoring the sea taf you know and then this is just a basic statement here but it does kind of show is sometimes the radio can be very beneficial in helping avoid a collision classic is Two-place aircraft, you really, really want to pay attention to the latching of the canopies and latching of the canopies no matter what. But uh, if you're flying a two-place aircraft by yourself or taking a passenger, assuring yourself that it is closed. You know, and then this was a report from a near mid-air collision associated with a glider. So for the instructors, you probably have seen some things already uh, that you want to use and take 
away from. But what I do want to highlight is now is really the time to get ready with that pen and paper to start taking some notes uh, because we're going to focus in on what you can do and what you may find from this report to help you and your students. You know, the major issues that we end up seeing in general is landing setup pattern, low final. Associated with that is stall spin at low altitude, which is not a good outcome. Premature termination of tow, rope break type stuff, and departure, the planning and execution of it. Outlandings, collision with obstacles, uh, or selection or failure to perform the outlanding, waiting too long. Hard landings, of course, you know, loss of control on landing. You know, we see that across all aircraft categories all the time, no matter what FISDO we're in, whether you're a safety rep or program manager or um, line inspector. But loss of control and collision, other than just at the point of landing, really can be detrimental. We, we find that to be the case, you know, like in ridge soaring is collision with terrain and ridge soaring usually ends up being a fatal type of accident. Just a broad overview for fiscal year 2020, we had 25 total, 13 were in pure gliders, eight in motor gliders and four in tow planes. Uh, we're gonna cover the motor gliders and tow planes tonight. When we did part one, this was an interesting statistic. We had, you know, ultimately close to um, 500 people, I recall, on the last webinar, once we got into the middle of it, but we had a poll question uh, as to whether they knew someone that was involved in a glider or tow plane accident. And basically two out of three of our attendees did uh you know we'd like to see that change a lot this is the past 10 years of ntsb data on accidents and what the fatalities are and the number without injuries you're showing 19 but in reality uh the ntsb has two of them marked as airplanes that really are motor gliders so there really was 21 there were seven fatal accidents and seven accidents without injuries and i know this causes a lot of debate but i did end up having um, some information and meeting with both the fa folks and the easa folks that get the data and you know this is pretty in line with what it is is we're looking at the accident rate for our hundred thousand hours flown uh, in gliders is about four, maybe five times worse than the fixed wing fleet as a whole. That's basically airplanes for the most part. And then our fatal rate, again, is about four or five times. So, you know, what we are doing is risky. I, I can't say otherwise to that. And many have written about it and many of us do know it. You know, you can see it in Soaring Magazine, Chess in the Air, Soaring Economists, the Wings and Wheels Weekly. You know, granted, due to low numbers and variations, there can be some large differences in what is calculated. And, you know, we want to get away from that large variation. And that's why I emphasize, you know, Soaring Society of America and Soaring Safety Foundation need the feedback from the clubs to be able to get better data on this. Uh, really does help. EASA does put out a report. Um, this is their accident rate. Uh, one thing to note, <laughs> EASA specifically has said is they wish they had data much like the FAAs. The, they only got about half the number of data points um, that the FAA is able to determine. And this is interesting here. Don't read this as 100,000 hours of flight time which is what I was showing you in the previous screen, but this is per flight. So think 100,000 hour landings, you know, and what looking at there is about seven accidents or so in 2019 per 100,000 landings. And then the fatal accident rate is a little bit over one. Now I went and took the FAGA survey data and compared and contrast that. I did have to use the 2018 data because that is 
actually calculations from AOPA, and at this time they had not done 2019 yet on the US piston fleet. But this is the ASA numbers that we see, and then taking that average landing rate, I think it was the 1.37 or 1.39 from before, plugging that into the number of hours flown, uh, you know, this is what we're looking at somewhere in this neighborhood for the US fleet, you know, probably somewhere around 15 or so, I would guess. Um, accidents per 100,000 landings or 100,000 flights and probably around five or six on the fatality rate, which again is somewhere in the neighborhood of what we have been seeing is about four or five times larger than what we see in the fixed wing fleet. Also, I did have somebody contact me, I, you know, a lot of work following the first presentation <laughs> with this and they had, uh, you know, sent me a statistic quoting that it was 40 in 100,000 in Germany prior to 2008. And that's actually a report that I'm very familiar with. And I know the research is it's not 40 in 100,000 hours or even 100,000 landings. But what the research actually says is it's one in every 2,500 pilots prior to 2008 um, were involved in an accident every year which is 40 in every 100,000 glider pilots. So taking that in the GA uh, survey information, the FAA believes there's about 25,000, just under 25,000 active pilots with a glider rating. We actually don't know how many are flying gliders. SSA might know that better, and that's part of why I'm encouraging you know, the clubs to help the SAA SSA with their request for information. But they said there were 14,085 private, 6,977 commercial pilots that were active with the glider rating and 3,927 with ATP. You know, and you plug those numbers in, this is what we were looking at is about, you know, one fatal accident for every 4,200 pilots, um, you know, which is, in the neighborhood of what they were seeing in Germany prior to that. If we look at where the accidents take place over month, this is fiscal year 2020, 2019 was much more centralized, much more spread out. And in April, this was April of last year, there were two more accidents, the two motor glider accidents that got counted outside of the glider category occurred there. And then the four tow plane accidents, these are the months that they ended up occurring in there. By the phase of flight, landing was most the highest, maneuvering second, approach in route. And then the highest injury level. If we look at a map, this is where fiscal year 2020 looked like with you know the number of records. This map, because it was is built off of NTSB data, does not include one motor glider accident that occurred in the state of Tennessee. In addition, there was an additional motor glider accident that did occur in Florida that is not counted in this. So Florida should be read in this also. As would expect on the side, I just put these are the states that the pilots were domiciled in that did have the accidents. Almost everybody was having accidents in their home states and gliders. And this is just the pilot age versus the months since their last flight review. You will see occasionally we have people that are expired, but I put up the year timeline. I always do advocate for this is, you know, do a proficiency check within a year and that will help um, break it down some. But you'll also see there's a large batch down here uh, in this portion. And believe it or not, this is actually consists of other areas we need to think about for proficiency checking and assuring ourselves. There are a lot of people in this group and not, what I have circled here basically falls into this almost exclusively is brand new solo 
student pilots or solo pilots, you know, rated in airplanes, maybe just endorsed for solo very recently. Um, you know, two of these are students signed off. Three were brand new glider pilots had just gotten their rating uh, in like the past six months or whatever. And then a couple more of these, it looks like they're professional pilots that are maybe using their airline qualification to meet the flight review experience requirement. But the last time they did a proficiency check in the glider is unknown and may have been quite a while ago. I always do advocate too, you know, this is something I'm coming up towards, is when you get to be that age that you retire, it's probably a really, really good idea. And I advocate for this to make sure that you really are doing a good proficiency check every year versus just meeting the flight review every two years. And that's what a big part of the WINGS program is. Another thing I look at is the age versus the time and type. These are our accidents um, from 2020, is we did have a few people that had quite a bit of time. Those are up here showing us 101 hours um, or more. But in reality, I was surprised at how little um, huge amounts of time were. Uh, most people were in the 100 to 200 hours. We only had one person that was way, way out there. But what does concern me, and we really are seeing this, and I bet you the insurance companies could talk to this a lot better than uh, I ever could, is we are wrecking a lot of gliders in their first 25 hours with the new owners. Uh, if you joined us on the Pure Glider, that is happening, definitely. You'll also probably see it here where people have had gliders less than six months, less than 25 hours, time in tight, and end up crashing uh, the glider, which ends up leading to at least an insurance claim uh, with it. In the FAA, we do take a look at the accidents and what we have determined to be the primary causal accidents. You'll notice pilot-induced error and loss of control is by far the largest primary causal uh, factors to it. We also are allowed to list contributing factors. That can be any number from zero to 10, 12, whatever it may be for each one. It is dependent upon the circumstances. You'll notice here loss of control, uh, stall spin, hard landings are big contributing factors. And then in the FAA, we also do look at what are known as the nine areas of FAA responsibility associated with the accident. And by far, airman competency skill ends up being the biggest issue. And you know, the hard thing there is most of those, not all of them, but most of those usually end up turning into what are known as re-examinations or 709 flights, uh, you know, and that ends up becoming a big, big factor. You know, it is something we, we need to think about or discuss, and I put out there for the instructors because it's a hard, hard conversation to have. Uh, I'll readily admit it, uh, but there are a lot of people, and in the glider world, maybe a bit more larger percentage, that end up having an event that gets put under airman competency skill set and they are requested to do a 709 which is what the FAA can do they can re-examine anything they certify whether it's airplanes airports pilots at any given time and that's uh, in 49 US code 44 709 that's where the 709 comes from uh, but you know, many pilots never end up doing it. Um, you know, they're at that point in their life, they're at that age where maybe they're not as good as they once were and something like this happens and it may take them a little bit of time to recover both physically and mentally from it. And then they get together with an instructor and find out that their skill set is not at the level that it needs to be. And it ends up being a sad way to end a wonderful flying uh, lifetime, to end up being put in that position where you're turning in your airman certificates um, versus retiring on your own terms. Yeah. So I do advocate, Dave knows this, this is part of where 
I look to the safety reps. I think it's a great idea to have a safety rep in your club because if something happens, they can start engaging on it right away and start a remedial training program uh, probably before the FA even starts investigating or looking into it. You know, and many times if the person is involved in that remedial training program and they see an entity like a club taking the responsibility and doing the right thing, many times they'll close it out with just counseling and remedial training versus a 709 ride. Have you ever seen anything like that before, Dave, or been involved in anything like that? Um, yes, I definitely have. And, you know, nobody wants to break a glider because they're really not making as many of them as they used to. And certainly that impacts everybody in the sport as we try to increase uh, just another challenge that we all go through. But, you, you know, you really have to look at the situation. We could have a completely uh, proficient pilot, competent pilot that just wasn't competent enough to meet the conditions that existed on that day. Uh, you know, everybody's anxious to get out there in the in the Northeast and get out there and fly now. And we're having you know, these blustery, gusty days. I think we really need to reflect on ourselves individually and use those, you know, those paved checklists to look at the environment, the external pressures, uh, and really evaluate and be honest with ourselves that, maybe our skills aren't at the beginning of the season what they will be you know later in the season i know that i do that myself too i it's been a little bit of an off season i haven't been instructing that much i'm going to bring the bar way down here as far as what i'm going to expose myself and my students to and i'm going to reevaluate that every time i go out on the field and and we safety reps are definitely um, a bridge between activity and accident if there's something happening on the field uh, or something happens it's not necessarily going to show up in a safety report and we're always looking for content things to get out there and outreach, uh, something happened to you that you'd like to share with others, and maybe that could give uh, pilots some information that they uh, would have the ability to think about a situation before it happens, uh, so they're not you know, completely task saturated when you get there. So please um, you know, use us for what we're here for. Yeah, it is very true. And, and you know, that's one of the great things Dave has seen this has been there, you know, has been helping us with this sort of stuff and really has helped out a lot of pilots. And that's one of the great things that a good safety rep can end up doing. So let's just take a look. Uh, the tow planes is, again, this is based upon the FAA fiscal year. The Soaring uh, Safety Foundation, their fiscal year starts a month later than the FAA one. So you might find a little bit of difference between the two reports, but we basically do cover it all. The first one on tow planes was in Big Flats, New York. This is right outside of Harris Hill, right near the beginning of the fiscal year for us on October 10th. The final has been uh, listed. It was listed as a ferry flight, PA-18, non-fatal, no injuries, basically. NTSB and FA were on scene. It was a collision during takeoff and landing. A little bit of more information. Is commercial pilot with a flight instructor rating, age 57. Uh, flight review was just two months prior, uh, which is good. Uh, hopefully, we, we see some good things here in this accident. Uh, did not have a good outcome. And I, I note this too, is someone was talking to me about this accident, but didn't necessarily know anything about the pilot. But, you know, it's kind of the classic and it's something we in the soaring industry need to also start coming to grips with is talking about, well, you know, these accidents happen because it's these young tow pilots without much experience, you know, getting into these situations. And you know what, I hate to say it, I go to a lot of clubs and I, I use mine too. Most of the people flying tow planes now have a lot of gray hair is we might be familiar with what it was 20 years ago or 30 years ago where, yeah, young kids like this guy fueling up this airplane here in this uh, picture, you know, doing a terrific job hanging around the airport, tomorrow's future of aviation, were the ones flying the tow planes in the past. But, you know, if they're looking at a career in aviation or something, so many of them are getting scoffed up here so quick that it really is. It's leaving the tow operations to those of us that have, you know, the gray hair on the temples and the gray hair on our chins when we grow out our beard. You know, and that's something I think we probably need to start thinking and talking about at a lot of different clubs. First class medical 
about 700 hours total time, 44 in the make and model, VMC conditions. What the intent was, was to pick up a glider that landed in auxiliary fuel, um, and they decided not to and were departing. I don't remember the details to this. I do know they have basically a private property that they will use for training purposes down the hill from Harris Hill. And I, I can't recall if this was exactly what happened, but I do believe what I had heard, and people from Harris Hill will know much, much better than I will, um, that either the glider or the tow plane, I believe, had landed in the incorrect field, the one right beside it. Uh, and as a result, that's why this whole situation started to develop. Uh, pilot did report that before takeoff, he consulted his mentor and best practices to take off and avoid obstacles. Thank, thank you. <laughs> you know, smart thing to be doing uh, with it. You know, but did realize it was risky and made a ground track deviation. And the left wing struck a guy wire and folded back and struck another one. And this is what it looked like here. I did actually blow this up because I'm going to talk about it in a second. But it really might be hard to see. But one thing that was specifically noted, and this is associated with maybe the stress of the event. It was not a factor in the accident, um, but it shows you the stress, how things can change and all of that, is the tow line was not retracted uh, in this attempted takeoff. It was still hanging out from before. Um, you know, and that's, things can get overlooked when in a stressful environment. There's another picture of it here uh, with the glider. Um, back there behind it. The probable cause by the NTSB was improper flight planning and subsequent failure to maintain clearance in the wires. And what I kind of put out there for takeaways, this is not everything to learn from it, maybe not even the best items to learn from it, but the things that caught my attention is first, kudos for getting some advice. I just, it is a bummer that it was not fully productive. When doing special operations, which tow is special operations, but even when you get into some type of special operation even deeper than this, take your time. You know, checklist, the tow rope was still out, could have been an issue. Special operations have very high risk, we do know that. You know, I it's, hate to say, but another tow pilot and glider pilot, glider instructor that I know had an accident kind of similar to this in which lost his life. Um, that's the accident report there. And, you know, I do ask associated with the checklist is for you, your club, your operation, you do have a before tow or takeoff checklist that you follow, right? Next accident was a tragic accident. It was a double fatal accident. It's only preliminary that happened out in Hawaii. It was instructional in this bird dog uh, with the intent of getting someone else qualified to tow. The NTSB and FAA were both on scene. This happened in February. The aircraft itself, if you look it up on the NTSB, it was involved in a prior accident in 2013, uh, the same aircraft. I mentioned that because it is interesting. The same airport had a very horrific accident associated with skydiving that um, it recently was released that the more recent accident factors playing into that were associated with the repair from the prior accident that that aircraft had been in. Uh, you know, that is an interesting thing outside of the glider world to take a look at. Pilots, one had ATP um, commercial, both were CFIGs, age 70 and 78. Again, see my prior comment about most tow pilots now have that gray hair on the temples uh, with it. You know, flight review for both of them was unknown, but um, if I do recall correctly, they were involved with a CAP, so it is likely that it's less than 12 months for them. And both the pilots flew an instructional week, the, uh, the weekend before, the airplane took off runway eight, did a lap in the pattern. Um, it was mentioned that maybe the landing was a bit rough, and then 
after that first landing, the rear seated instructor pilot got out, walked around the airplane and stopped alongside the front seated pilot and they talked for a while. The instructor then got in, started up and they took off again. And witnesses reported that as the airplane, you know, was climbing out, it started yawing to the right and drifted south down into a tree line. And from the NTSB, this is what the track of it looked like, the short flight. And this is what the aircraft looked like after. I do wanna emphasize here, this is a preliminary report only. Uh, can't share more information, but I would encourage people to watch for the final report on this one. It may still be a while out there, but it, it definitely, I think it will be an interesting one with it. Um, so do definitely watch for the final NTSB report on this one. Some takeaways, pressure I've heard, and it is unconfirmed that they were out flying with the intent to get the other pilot qualified to tow cap cadets later on in that day uh, for them flying in gliders. In fact, from what I had heard, um, although I don't have it written down anywhere, this was basically hearsay, I guess, is a way to describe it, is that there was a CAP encampment uh, going on and that there were CAP cadets that were present on the airport when this accident did happen. And I just bring that up is when that type of event is going on, does it bring out that added pressure to perform, you know, expectations? And then what happens if someone is not meeting those expectations? You know, a lot of stress starts to develop. Uh, this could possibly be a maintenance related accident. So I want to put out there, you know, how often do you do a pre advanced pre-flight on the aircraft? How often do you really look it over? Is it only the mechanic that's really looking it over? You know, in the airplane world, we see a lot of accidents. It's the second highest cause of accidents in the airplane world is maintenance related. Uh, you know, and I would emphasize maybe take a look at the fast team advanced pre-flight outreach that we end up doing, you know. You definitely want to take a look at that. Byron, California was the next one. This was a tragic accident in which we lost the tow pilot. I know the Soaring, Safety, or Soaring Society of America did a webinar specifically oriented around this accident uh, because we have had a few kiting accidents over the years. It is still preliminary. It was glider tow with a scout, and that was the uh, 126 down there was fatal for the tow plane accident. Glider pilot, no injuries. FAA was on scene, not the NTSB on this one. Uh, private pilot, tow pilot, ATP CFI uh, in the glider, age 62. The asterisks are for the glider pilot specifically who had had their flight review just six months prior, which if I recall correctly, I'm going off the top of my head here, was um, added rating. 2,800 total, only 110 in gliders in the make and model is unknown. It is a toast guillotine um, tow rope that was on the tow plane. What was reported was following the normal takeoff, initiate a slight right turn, and then the glider canopy opened. Glider pilot became briefly disoriented and turned back towards the airport, you know, is well, my tow plane is up there in the wall, but, you know, started to turn back with the rope still attached, large amount of lift equates to a large amount of drag being pulled on the rope on that tow plane, really, really probably uh, dissipated the kinetic energy for the tow plane on it. And then as they neared, the tow pilot cut the tow line, but ended up in an aggressive nose low attitude and impacted the ground. And you see how quick it happens. This is available on the uh, NTSB report, the preliminary, but in just six seconds, it goes from a normal tow where you can see them to this situation where the glider is very, very high 
creating a lot of drag on it. And I bring it up, you know, the 126 is a little bit different, but, you know, tow requires a lot of responsibility for both pilots. And one of the things we got to think about is teaching the gutches of the different aircraft in our fleets and all of that. You know, this is a 126 and this is a common thing I see. The older 126s have um, latches that are pins that are spring loaded that you squeeze and then release. And you really want to do like you see me doing here with my hand is make sure you move those pins to where they should be because it's common like you see right here for them not to fully close but to stay retracted slightly and you know that can definitely be a factor in a canopy coming open also you know this is a 233 but there's a newer 126s or d and e models i should say uh tend to have a canopy closure that's more similar to this 233 mechanism but there's also other factors there that can end up occurring is there's a roll pin in here that can break that you can end up moving the lever but not completely latching it if that roll pin has broken same thing uh can happen if the spring is broken on this and these are the little gutches that you want to point out um, to your students. Each aircraft in your fleet at your club that you teach in is going to have all of, have its little nuances, its little quirks. And, you know, if it's maintenance related, you want to get them corrected. But also it's a piece of machinery. It's not precise and exact all the time. So you want to point out what may be a little bit different with it. You know, you can also have the warning up. So a few things there, as I do emphasize, tow does require a lot of responsibility for both pilots, but I've been known to say that glider pilots have to love their tow pilots, but the tow pilot only has to like the glider pilot. And what that basically means is like them enough not to drop them in the wrong spot. You know, there's, as a glider pilot, you really do have the life of the tow pilot in your hands um, with it. You know, the tow pilot, it's only for a small period of time that if they released you, you could be in a very bad spot as a glider pilot. But, you know, it's a much longer duration that you can have a negative impact on the tow pilot as a glider pilot than it is, I think, the other way around. Something else to think about, uh, you know, we see this with the glider canopy openings, but training and prepping the startle response, managing the hazard, you know, scenario-based training. You hear that from the Soaring Safety Foundation. And I, I give you just an example. I don't do this at low altitude, but, you know, trying to bring this up and we'll have a discussion with students on this after it. But, you know, I've been known in the 233 to open the rear window um, on it and then allow you know, say bang really loud, maybe just punch the rudder a little bit to shake things up. And it, it is amazing at how many people will, um, you know, kind of lock up because it's just all different. It, you know, it's something they haven't seen. They haven't been startled like that in their flying. And, you know, it's a good learning opportunity. It is startling to them. I, I will readily admit that and not trying to scare them but to provide them the opportunity to see something like that before it could happen to them in the rest of their flying, in the rest of their lives, and be able to have a discussion about that is how important it is to always fly the aircraft. Also, I can't emphasize this enough, is pre-flight checklists. You know, not only using a flow, but having a written backup to it. That's one of the things I see in the glider community is generally kind of weak on. And then also using the ground crew, you know, really emphasize it's a CRM environment with ground crew is have them, get them involved to do a double check. It's a terrific thing because they can find stuff. You know, any of us that have worked and helped launch gliders have seen things, you know, people that are saying they're ready to go without their uh, seatbelts done up you know, without their parachute done up 
without their canopy closed and latched. These are all the sort of things that, you know, someone running the wing can really, really help out. And also to emphasize, you know, canopy openings can be deadly. In this case here, you know, it appears for the tow pilot, uh, but boy, you can look at the statistics on two seaters that have had the canopy open and it's not all that good in terms of the outcomes on two seaters. And I was mentioning, you know, teaching the gutches of a new aircraft. And I put this out there as a club instructor, when was the last time you flew, um, you know, a single seat glider in your club? Do you know what the gutches are in it? You know, that's something I would emphasize, at least fly each of the gliders once per year, if you're teaching in a club. Last tow plane accident for the year was in late August. It was this 182. Uh, it's still preliminary. It was Cessna 182G. This is the information here on it. The FAA was on scene. It was a private pilot, no glider rating, age 84. Uh, it was tow pilot's age, flight review unknown. Um, it is suspected that it was expired, but we do not know the answer to that. Medical technically was valid. However, I do want to point out FAR 6153. And one thing that is different, this accident did lead to an enforcement action being initiated. And that is so exceptionally rare, very, very rare uh, for us in the FAA to have an accident and actually then have an enforcement action following up on it. So the pilot did not provide a statement to the FAA. Um, however, individuals at the airport reported that the pilot attended a medical exam with an AME the day following the accident. Uh, inspection of the aircraft showed that the fuel tanks contained little to no fuel. But the, the takeaways that I will give you here to think about is, it, is in your club or even your own personal aircraft, very, very important to know who is flying your aircraft, uh, what their qualifications are, what they're doing, uh, making sure that they meet the regulatory requirements of it. With this, I would also emphasize, take advantage of the Soaring Safety Foundation site surveys that are available. That's one of the big things that they find. They don't share the um, data for any individual club. Um, from the site surveys, but from a safety perspective in their outreach and in their FERCs, they will talk about what they have seen over the years as trends with clubs. And that's something that you really, really want to make sure at your club that the people are qualified, what their emergency contact information is and all of that, you know, and it is important in the, in a civil case, if the person's not qualified, the club is really probably going to take it hard. Um, and even in the eyes of the FAA, you know, the operator of the club may have some culpability in it if the pilot is not qualified and an accident occurs. Uh, you know, what happens to you if Joe Pilot's flying your aircraft and they're not rated or qualified? Insurance wise, think about that too. And I hate to say this, it can be much, much worse. Uh, some of you may know the person out there, but a former employee with me in our large government agency uh, lost his first wife to an accident where there was a stall spin and the person claiming to be a flight instructor uh, that caused it was not. And it ended up leading to a stall spin accident that killed them both uh, with it. So I have to put that out there. Always recommend an annual proficiency check, all, as I mentioned earlier, as we get into our twilight years. And if you haven't seen it or heard about it before, this is the information on the uh, soaring safety outreach here. Motor gliders, Pennsylvania in October, we had this one here, preliminary still, a LAC 17B was fatal. NTSB and FA were both on scene. Uh, commercial pilot, age 55, flight review unknown. Uh, time in the past year, 
was 87 plus hours. Actually, I got that information off of OLC records, so that's why I have the plus. It came to at least 87. 71 hours in type uh, had acquired the glider just six months prior to it. You know, this is what was reported. Yeah, climbing the weak thermal, that was the last communication. They found it on the side of a ridge. The leading edges of both wings had tree limb impressions along the length of the wings, uh, crushed by impact forces. And Flarm and LX Nav Avionics were removed to go to uh, the Vehicle Records Laboratory. And that's one of the benefits we have as electronics now do help us with many of these accidents. Some of the takeaways, there's still a lot to be determined, but it is helpful, even if it's not the best outcome to have a satellite tracker on this. I mentioned this because this accident, I happened to see the night before on glideport.arrow, uh, which is used by the Soaring Society of America. And I can remember looking at the track thinking, boy, that's a weird place for that track to end. Uh, that way, I wonder if the battery ran out or something like that. And then when I went into work the next day, found out what had happened and, you know, put two and two together and was like, oh, that's not good news. But what it did allow is having a tractor when you're doing cross country, um, you know, to have resources made available to you uh, as quickly as possible with it. You know, something to discuss in training and recurrent is ridge soaring, you know, the dangers associated with it, height, wing clearance, speed, velocity, even flying the glider into the trees if needed, if not able to make it to a land out field, you know, lessons that can be learned uh, from that. And as I mentioned already, the benefits of electronics, we're going to know much, much more about it. And I would encourage you to you know, if you're flying cross country and gliders, make sure that you do have a satellite tracker. Uh, it really will make a difference. And big, big difference, you can take a look at other events that Soaring Society of America and others have done. Big difference between a satellite-based tracking system, a cellular-based tracking system, or a PLB, personal locator beacon that has to be activated by pushing it on is depending upon where you are in the world or the country, there's significant differences in how each of those operate. Next one was in April, it was one of the two um, motor glider accidents that occurred that were not shown as gliders by the NTSB. This is actually a picture of the actual glider here. It is still preliminary as part 91 Peepistrel sinus uh, was fatal for the one pilot on board. Uh, the FAA was on scene, uh, but not the NTSB. A pilot had just gotten their new glider rating. Uh, it was age 66. Flight review had occurred just two months prior, which was getting the new rating. Total time. Uh, listed as 85 plus hours, but that's what they listed when they got their private pilot airplane single engine land back in 1982. Uh, it appears that the pilot did not fly any, if much at all since then, but had 53 hours time in type when they got their glider rating in early 2020. And the aircraft was purchased an airworthiness certificate issued in February of 2020. In this case here, as I mentioned, the NTSB has it listed as an airplane, although glider is mentioned in the description of it and the FAA airworthiness of it is an LSA glider. Pilot was flying over the airport and in the local area most of the day down in Marathon. Two witnesses stated that they heard an unusual loud sound, looked around, saw the small airplane and determined where it was coming from. And the nose of the glider dropped down and about a second before impacting a house, the um, ballistic parachute deployed during the impact. And this is where it ended up. 
inside this house. A few takeaways is how important mentorship is in a new rating. And this is a challenge we face in the sport of soaring and in the glider world is the motor glider club using that terminology allows you to operate i think outside of a realm where there's a lot of availability for mentorship in a typical glider club you're definitely going to see the mentorship there people that have been there done that the instructors but individuals that are out there in motor gliders may truly be out there on their own in the motor gliders and as a result may not get the mentorship that they need the recovery chute training uh, that's always an important factor and if you know the airplane world you'll see the big changes that have occurred with the cirrus airplane you know when that first came out its accident rate was not looking that good they really made a big big push for using the parachute and how to use the parachute and really, really made a difference in the accident rate on that aircraft. And, you know, as a result, it's kind of considered a hallmark now um, in the aviation safety world. And you do want to watch for more. There may be something maybe associated in the final report with maintenance in this one. Next one was up in Tennessee, similar type of aircraft. This was not it. This was the aircraft from the previous accident. Uh, the final has been issued there as Park 91 uh, personal flight, non-fatal, no injuries, no one went on scene. It was described as a loss of lift. Uh, I was private pilot glider, sport, airplane, single engine land, age 47, flight review just four months before, 1,200 hours total, almost all of it in this particular make and model and the particular aircraft. The pilot did report winds in the area he was flying at 340 at 25 gusts to 39. Uh, again, airworthiness is LSA glider, but they marked it as an airplane. Um, and the aircraft was purchased in 2013. Little interesting side note, and it might be associated with this mentorship. Um, the pilot did not get their glider rating until late in 2015. With that amount of time, we don't know, but there may be the possibility that the pilot was flying it without the appropriate ratings, flying it like an airplane before him. That is unknown. But at least thankfully did get the glider rating. <laughs> um, reported turn the motor glider toward an area lift was expected, but continued to descend. Then when about 300 feet above the trees, he unfeathered the propeller and started the engine, continued to downdraft, deployed the parachute, no pre-accident mechanical failures or anything, and it ended up looking like this in the trees. You can see the parachute here with it. Uh, you know, device worked and worked well, if able to basically walk away from it. But motor gliders encounter with atmospheric lift, not sufficient to maintain flight, I point out here, if you take a look at the profile, see this quite often, um, ridge and wave interaction. Person was trying to ridge soar along the ridge down in this area um, from what specifically recall, recall right along the state line and got on the ridge in one area and found that there was just no lift there and was trying to get out and was unable to. And you always can some, or I shouldn't say you always, but you can sometimes find wave action coming off of a ridge prior that may be pushing down, have the downward portion of the wave right on top of the ridge where the ridge lift should be and ends up suppressing it out. Based upon the information around here, I would not be surprised if this was the case. And this is a hard thing, you know, if you fly only in the area of thermals, you don't have much opportunity to talk about ridge lift too often. Again, the mentorship with it, understanding the review and possible interaction, being careful on the reliance of the engine to save you, you still need a place to land in accordance with 91-119, you know, to, uh, without undue hazards to persons or property on the ground. 
if an engine were to fail, that applies even to motor gliders. You know, and also understand this is something we see is ridge flying does not tend to be a style of soaring that the engine can save you. You know, there's so little time, you're so close to the ground, there's so much drag associated with either unfeathering the propeller and getting the engine started or getting the engine up and mounted out of the aircraft that we do end up seeing, you know, accidents associated with that. And this was a good example of how the airframe parachute could be a backup. Next one is Stewart's Draft, Florida, Part 91, Ventus, non-fatal. Minor injuries, uh, the NTSB has it listed as none. However, in the pilot statement to the NTSB, the pilot does talk about minor injuries and uh, describes it as such. Loss of lift out on cross country. ATP and glider CFI, age 59. Flight review just three months prior, 18,000 plus hours. Just 142 hours in the make and model. This aircraft was actually involved in a prior accident in the midair back in 2010 and rebuilt. Um, and this is one of those circumstances too. It was reported in the FAA investigation that the pilot had completed a level of the wings program. But when someone like myself dug into it, we see this is very common. They had only met the knowledge portion of it and not the flight portion. To achieve a level of wings, you need to do both the ground and the flight portion. And Dave, do you see that to be a common misconception? Yeah, I really, uh, I see that a lot. I see a lot of people going in and, uh, you know, completing the knowledge, which is, which is great. I mean, you know, the requirements to meet the, the, or the, what you have to do to meet the requirements for a flight review is a minimum of ground. And I see it's not uncommon for people to go in and be doing, you know, 30 or 40 hours of ground over two years just by self-selecting these seminars. But, you know, really getting out and flying and working on particular things with a CFI, even as a CFI, going out and flying with other CFIs as we do, Steve. I, I like to get up with you once a year and, and you know, brush the rust off a little bit and, and see if I can meet all the standards that, that I did when I got my certificate. Um, that's so important. I, I would love to see a little more information on these accidents about, you know, meeting a flight review. I really try to, to, to meet the requirements of a flight review in every aircraft that I fly. You know, single engine, multi-engine, even just different styles of aircraft. If I'm flying a Warrior all the time or something, I'll hop out and do something in a Cessna or a tailwheel, just to force myself to that level of proficiency because it is so, it is so um, characteristic to what you particularly are flying. Yeah, that is true, and we do have to do that. We usually do do it uh, once every year, and I'll extend a compliment to another um, CFI out there, but another glider CFI who flies like we do, Dave, hit me up and said, you know what, I want to fly with you again this year, Steve, but this year I want to do it in the tow plane, not in the glider. Is I, I think I need a little bit of extra instruction towards the wings program in the tow plane uh, this year. So uh, I'll agree with you there. So just a few more minutes, folks. We are getting right here at the end, but in this case here, decided to land on the brown flat field. Pilot set up, deployed the sustainer engine, did not start, you know, so continued the approach to landing. During the landing, struck the ground and the glider ground loop substantially damaged. In the statement said he would recommend trying to start the sustainer engine at a higher altitude. That is a common uh, comment that we do see following a lot of these motor glider accidents. And this is what it looked like here, you know, the results of the ground loop. Loss of thermal contributing was the delayed attempt to start the engine restart. What I would put out there for takeaways to think about here is professional pilots, I mentioned this, that meet the flight review regulatory requirements easily. But for those professional pilots to think about when was the last time you had a real proficiency check in a glider, the type of flying is vastly different. Don't Again, I don't know if that was the case here. The, he may have just completed a terrific proficiency check because a lot of things were right in this accident, but a bad outcome um, to it um, very well could have. But 
in a broad sense, that's something that we do see. We talk about professional pilots. They meet the regulatory uh, criteria, but may not necessarily be doing well at meeting the proficiency uh, criteria when stepping down into something like a glider. Two cycle engines can be temperamental, especially if cold. It was noted in this one that had been up at 8,000 feet for a long period of time. May or may not have been a factor, but something to think about if you're flying motor gliders there. Uh, also, motor gliders are just notoriously challenging to start and fail, you know, and especially in stressful situations, so to plan accordingly in the added drag associated with the engine extended you know it's maybe part of the reason why on the outlandings sometimes a poor decision results in an outlanding that's executed well but the terrain has an impact so you have to be careful of the bank angle at low altitudes you know just catching a wingtip how detrimental that can end up being and also if you're flying a motor glider you know think about the importance maybe over your home airport or whatever right over to maybe practice a little bit off airport landings or landing at a different airport with plenty of um criteria for your glide but with the extend engine extended because boy it's really going to put a detriment to your gliding capabilities um significantly brookline we had this motor glider a sinus it was a tailwheeled version unlike the tricycle gear versions that we saw before was non-fatal injuries none fa was on scene abnormal runway contact private pilot age 79 21 months since the flight review 770 hours total only 10 or so hours in make and model it was an amateur built kit and the pilot himself was the builder to it was landing on the nearly 2,000 foot long, 24 foot wide runway with a six knot quartering tailwind. On the second attempt to land, was he was also high and fast, but elected to continue the approach to landing using full air brakes and wing flaps. Slowed the motor glider to 40 knots, uh, six knots above the stall speed. Um, depending upon the FA or NTSB report, it's either 40 or 42 knots. The manufacturer lists that the stall speed for this aircraft with full flaps and no dive brakes, I emphasize here dive brakes stowed, spoilers stowed, is 34 knots. Um, so likely that stalled it from about 10 feet above the runway and landed hard. Manufacturer says final approach speed should always be 55 knots with full flaps, regardless of zero or full dive brakes. And this is what the aircraft looked like after the um, Bazzi light structure that was hit also. Failure to maintain airspeed with a quartering tailwind resulted in loss of controls. And we talked about approach speed, especially in gusty or turbulent conditions in the sink on the approach end of runway 19. That is true. I've flown in and out of this airport. Always think about teaching the effect of spoilers on stall speed, building, keep flying, get some time. Pilot does wish that had done this. Bend Oregon, preliminary, personal, AC5, fatal. No one on scene. What is interesting is there's basically no other FA records on this. I have very, very little information on this one. Age 65 most things are unknown on it and what it was described as and had the fire it had landed near some fuel tanks but i think most of the fire was a result of the brush you know some of the takeaways sometimes it is hard to get the data and this is one of those cases where this accident at least from my perspective right now until the ntsb report comes out don't have much uh, it is important though i will mention the ac4 ac5 community you know to help each other out on specific types of aircraft with getting information about the types how important it is for always doing positive control checks again not sure if that was a factor here and also 
no matter whether you're flying a pure glider or a motor glider, is being ready for that premature termination of tow um, or engine failure, engine issue on takeoff. Lakeport, California in August. This one is fairly recent, so not a lot of information here also. Was fatal for the pilot. Uh, neither the FAA or NTSB on scene. Pilot was age 81, flight review unknown. Time and type was only approximately 20 hours because had purchased the glider only back in March. So it was a fairly new glider to them. Launched about 1,200 on a local flight, recently purchased, but did not return home. And family members used the spot satellite tracking device, which gave the last position. You know, and according to first responders, it was found in multiple sections. And then it was found off. This is track information here uh, associated with the aircraft. There's much to be learned in the future on this one. I'll just re-emphasize the satellite tracking with it. And then electronics again is we'll hopefully learn much more about this, but you'd be amazed at how much information we can gather from the electronics on the aircraft. At the tail end here, we had this motor glider accident, which was two serious injuries during the takeoff. Private pilot, age 55, flight review 11 months prior, 290 hours total, only 20 hours in the make and model, but had had the aircraft for a little bit over three years prior. Um, it is noted by the NTSB investigator that very limited information was given to the NTSB in this accident report. And the pilot reported landing back taxi and failed to stow the speed brakes, dive brakes uh, on the takeoff and ran off the end of the runway as a result. You know, we talk about how important that is, checklist usage, and this is where they ended up off the end of the runway. You can see them here with first responders, and you can see the track associated with this. And believe it or not, it actually was the first response. They had to wait for the first responders to get there in order to get out of the aircraft. Uh, with the way that the nose crumpled with a canopy, they were pinned in the aircraft until the time that first responders could extricate them from the aircraft. So again, I'll emphasize checklists, you know, is it's okay to do a flow, but you know, please use a written checklist. Um, you know, mnemonic devices we do see end up leading to accidents. M making sure that you have a hand or maybe something else in an appropriate location for takeoff. Uh, you know, it just might be an elbow that in a motor glider that you're keeping close or a portion of your leg. I've flown a lot of motor gliders, touring motor gliders like this, have flown this type before. You know, you can use a piece of your body to tell you if the dive brakes are opening. Uh, and also, you know, I mentioned this, but a couple things to think about that you may not is escape procedures. It was jammed in, as I mentioned here, in proficiency. How much do you need to fly to be a safe pilot? And that's what I want to mention is safety is more than just not having an accident. We learn a lot of things from the incidents that occur, such as gear up landings and things like STEMAs, occurrences in outlandings in fields or other locations. You know, and even non accidents, other events happen elsewhere. You know, this is from Wings and Wheels, and they did a good little story on the safety of just towing your aircraft and what is involved there. So I wanna put this out to the instructors is, you know, take a look at yourselves, take a look at your students, take a look at your club is how close are we to having an accident and are we really being safe with what we're doing? Because there are some things that we do end up doing sometimes that, we're, that we think we're trying to do the right thing and it ends up not necessarily being the case. And, you know, from the 2020 report, this is what the Soaring Safety Foundation is putting an emphasis on. And I'll put these items out here for you to think about, which 
are all important things, especially I try to reach out here to the flight instructors. You know, and then other things that I will add to it, collision avoidance, canopy, written checklists. As an instructor, being willing to say, I get the aircraft, uh, you know, in an appropriate time where it's not too late. That doing premature termination of tow training has much more added risk to it. Do an annual review and check a new glider. Take it easy for the first 25 hours. You know, all of these things, being willing to launch or abort a launch, positive control checks and flying the aircraft through the accident and not rushing. You know, so do look out for these in the future. The Soaring Society of America webinars are continuing. They're moving into a regional program, which is terrific. Uh, we here in the New England area do a webinar the last Tuesday evening of every month. Like I said, you can catch this recording and others on the Boston Fast Team YouTube channel and look at the handouts. If you want a couple little quick videos out there to help you as an instructor on the FAA Wings program, there's this video. Where are my wings credit and how do I use them? I think that one might be from you, is it, Dave? Uh, yep, that is. That shows you um, when you get credits. A lot of times when people get an email, it'll say what, what credit is exactly designed for it. So that allows you to go in and create that uh, profile and assign all that and go ahead and complete a phase. So it's only about 10 minutes long and uh, it's real good to go back to refer to if you have a problem. Uh, you can do it on your own time. Excellent. And on the instructor portal. So now is the time to go fly. You know, be that proficient pilot out there. So do want to thank you. Here is our contact information. Uh, if you have it, I thank you for sticking around. Uh, I know we ran just about 10 minutes over from what we had planned. I do apologize for that. That's why we're moving this into three parts next year uh, specifically. So I do want to thank you for joining us. You can go ahead and sign off now. We will stick around just for a few minutes to answer some questions, but you don't have to stick around for those. You're welcome to if you'd like, but you will get credit for having joined us through to this point. So thank you everyone and be safe out there.